All right, well, I have no idea where everybody is, but uh, apparently it's a rain day, so such is life. We're going to start anyway. Um, today, we're going to spend the day talking about color theory, and then I'll show you some Charlie Harper examples. And actually, truth be told, in your exercise, you get a lot of time to just work on your Charlie Harper assignment uh, for next uh, Wednesday. So it all works out well in the end. Um, color theory is the kind of thing where you could spend a whole class or a whole semester discussing just colors and color theory and how they work and why you pick certain colors and whatever. I'm going to condense it down into like 30 minutes so you get the crash course in color theory. But it's still important to, to bring it up and talk about it and to show you some examples. And I hope there's some that will stick with you today so that you'll make better decisions about color. That's really the ultimate thing. Um, the, the one other thing that I will say is as I talk about color theory, I'll make it sound like it's the most important thing in the world. And it's important, but it's not necessarily the most important thing. Uh, and I think I have a tendency in lectures to, to get really excited about something, and then it sounds like, oh, man, I, you know, if you pick the wrong color, it's, you're, you're doomed on your project. That's not the case. Uh, you know, if you pick a color because you really like it, you, know, you pick red because you literally like red as an accent color, even though it's a very aggressive color, it still might work just fine in your project. So don't feel like this is the law, but it's also something to, to kind of be floating around in the back of your head to think about. Now, some of this you learned in kindergarten. You played with finger paints, you mixed paints together, and you learned a lot of this. We're going to go over it, um, even though it's kind of redundant. We have, we have basically a color wheel. We start with our primary colors, our reds, our yellows, and our blues. In between the red and the blue, for example, so there's our red, there's our blue. In between those two colors, we get a secondary color which is purple, or in this case, violet. In between our yellow and our red, we get our orange, etc. In between a primary color, I'll come down here, in between a primary color and a secondary color, we get a tertiary color, which is the in-between color. And you can keep dividing up the color wheel, etc. Complementary colors are colors that complement each other, and they're located exactly opposite on the color wheel. So if we had, say, yellow, yellow's complement would be purple. So it works nice. So if you're, if you're just trying to pick two colors, frequently if you pick the color's complement, you're in good shape. So you want to accent something. You have a lot of red. You want to accent something. You put it in green. You have a lot of purple. You want to accent something. You put it in yellow. Same thing with blue. You have a lot of blue. You want to to show something, you put orange next to it, and it's going to stand out. And so it's a good contrast, and they work and play well together. Analogous colors, on the other hand, are colors that are very similar to each other. They're next to each other on the color wheel. They tend to match nicely. They go together nicely. But there's not one that stands out against the others. So you might end up with a group of analogous colors, a group of similar colors that are working together. And then you pick the analogous colors complement as the accent color. Color systems. Anybody been to the Exploratorium in San Francisco before? For a while, they had an exhibit that was great about this, where you could stand in front of, they had a couple colored lights, uh, and you could stand in front of those colored lights, and your shadows would turn different colors based on what lights you stood in front of. Um, and I don't think they have the exhibit up anymore. But it's a, it's a really good way of kind of seeing this particular color system. So we have two distinct color systems that we work with on an everyday basis. One of them is an RGB color system. And we've, we've talked about these a little bit. And I've said, oh, pick CMYK here, or pick RGB here. Now is my turn to actually explain what these are. And so an RGB color system is essentially a color system that's built with light. So it's things that illuminate, things like our monitor screens, our iPads, our phones. Electronic devices generally are in this color space. So if we're working in this color space for like web applications and that sort of thing, this is the color space we want to be working in. And the reason that we work in it is because colors are made by adding lights together. So on your monitor screen, for example, right next to each other, you can barely see it because they're so small. But there are three little LED lights that light up, or little filters, or however your particular monitor works. One red, one green, and one blue. Well, obviously, making red on the screen is pretty easy. You just turn on the red color. If you want to make green, you just turn on the green color. But if you want to make yellow, you turn on the red color and the green color next to each other, 
and the two colors add together, the two lights add together to make yellow. So it's an additive system. You put the lights together, they make yellow. If you put red, green, and blue all together and you turn all three of them on, they make white. So it's an additive color system. Okay? This matters when we start matching colors. If we want something to be a particular color and we want to make sure it turns out to be that color in, uh, on every monitor, we want to be in this color space. The opposite of that is the CMYK color system. And so this is totally different. This is what happens when we print documents. So we no longer have something that's illuminated, that's shining at us. We have no light source. The way that this works is about light absorption. And so I think the easiest way to kind of conceptualize this is to think of the color toner that's in a color laser printer. You have, you have four different toners in that color laser printer. You have a cyan, which is that blue color. You have a magenta, which is obviously the magenta color, and you have a yellow. You also have a key or a black. We'll get to black in a little bit. So if we take the cyan and the magenta, the reason that the color on the page is cyan or the reason that the color on the page is magenta is because that pigment, that ink, is absorbing all the other spectrums of light except for cyan. So it absorbs everything else. So the light shines down on the page it absorbs everything except for what the color is. That's reflected back at you. That's how we see cyan. If we combine the toner from cyan and magenta together, the light that's reflected back to us is blue. So we've combined those two toners together. We get the blue light reflected back to us. If we combine all three, the cyan, the magenta, and the yellow, theoretically, we get black. So in the other color space, remember we combine all the colors together, they are the, the red, the green, the blue, they become white. In this color space, you combine all the colors together, they become black. Truth is, getting nice, pure, rich black using those three colors is a little tricky, which is why most color printers also include a black cartridge that is just black. And so that works out nicely because we can just substitute in the black instead of trying to combine all three colors together. You may have seen this happen. Sometimes if you're trying to print a dark gray, it, it has a skew one direction or another. It has too much of one of those toners in it, and it's not quite a perfect black. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Color theory essentially says that there's meaning behind every particular color that we choose. And so we as designers need to be aware. We need to make deliberate decisions about why we're choosing something to be a particular color. And we need to be aware of that, and that's going to have meaning in our overall design. Color theory is at its core about developing aesthetically pleasing color relationships. There are generally specific color groups that are associated with mo emotions. So we can kind of lump colors together based on their emotions. We have warm colors, we have cool colors, and we have neutral colors. The warm colors, unsurprisingly, are reds, yellows, and oranges. I think the easiest way to think of that is fire. Reds, yellows, orange make up flyer. We get uh, warmth, etc. They're often associated with feelings of happiness, joy, excitement, those kinds of things. And uh, as an example, in 2009, some of the websites that were struggling suddenly introduced a bunch of yellow on their pages to try to make people excited. And hey, guess what? We're OK. Everything's going to be OK. It's really interesting to see this. And I'm going to show you some examples a little bit later on. Cool colors, blues, greens, purples. They're, they're kind of like, if you think of winter or ice or something like that, you're going to get those, these colors. Um, they're often used to, in professional type websites. Big corporations use them. You know, think Dell or you know, it's kind of a big stable GE. Uh, they're going to use blue in their, in their websites. They're going to use blue in their logos because they want to be this established, stable, hey, we are nice, we're, we're professional, we're stable, etc. Then we have the neutral colors, the in-betweens. These are the whites, the browns, the blacks, the grays. And so these don't really evoke much emotion either way. Though truth be told, we can have warm grays, and we can have cool grays, and we can get really into gray. I mean, gray is the in color right now, right? So we can, we can skew those just a little bit by putting some more blue into the gray or putting some more yellow into the gray, et cetera. But generally speaking, they're more neutral than the colors themselves. So let's talk specifically about some of the major colors that you may be faced with picking. 
So red is often symbolic of fire, power. It's association with passion or importance. On the negative side, it might be anger, emergency, rage, those kinds of connotations. So when you're picking to use red in a particular project, you want to be aware of the fact that it's going to draw a lot of attention, and sometimes it's, it's a very powerful color. And so you want to make sure that you're thinking about that when you're choosing that as a particular color. As we move down in the spectrum, we're going to go to orange next. Generally, orange is associated with happiness, joy, sunshine, childlike exuberance. Sometimes it's still a little bit on the aggressive side, though it's a step down from red. It's not quite as aggressive as red would be, uh, and it can be symbolic of ignorance or deceit. Yellow is generally the happy color. And all I have to do is, is ask my four-year-old son to draw a picture, and we get yellow sun in the corner. You guys remember this as kids, right? You, you draw the picture, you draw the house, the sun goes in the corner, it's yellow, it's got the little rays, it's happy. Same thing happens here. Brightness, energy, optimism, happiness. There's a reason yellow shows up in a lot of brands, because they want people to be happy about their brand. Um, on the flip side of that, though, yellow caution tape at a crime scene. So there is, there is kind of a, another side to the happiness. Um, caution, criticism, jealousy, etc. cetera. Uh, I actually, I always point this out because I think it's fun, although the yellow has faded. There was a day, I would say maybe two years ago, when I came in and everyone on campus, every one of the little grates there that are out the drains had bright yellow painted around them. And it's amazing how much that catches your attention when you're walking around and like everything's bright yellow now. Now you can't see it anymore. So you do like my wife when she was in Europe and she got her feet stuck in the grate. That was why they do it, because they don't want you to get your feet stuck. Anyway, it was a funny story. Yellow can be symbolic of caution. So in certain circumstances, you want to see that, and you want to pay attention to it. So it can bring up to your attention. So just be aware. Green, symbolic of nature, sustainability, the, the green movement, all of that kind of thing, associated with growth, harmony, nature, those types of things. It's also symbolic of money. There's a reason that all the money websites tend to revolve around the color green. So you go to mint.com and it's green. No surprise. So there's an association there. Uh, it can show greed. That's also kind of a negative association of the m whole money thing. Uh, it can be used for a beginner or somebody who has a lack of experience. Somebody who's green, not necessarily sustainable green, we're talking green as in lack of experience, somebody new to something. Blue, we already touched on blue a little bit um, because it's one of the cool colors, but blue is, tends to be that peaceful, calming color. You know, you think of the ocean, you think of big lakes, you think of that kind of environment. It exudes stability, expertise, big name corporations are gonna use it, the White House website uses it. Hey, we're nice and stable. I don't know that we are, but the point is we're trying to present that. Symbolizes trust, dependability. It's also very cold or passive or hands off. So here is, this is an old slide. This is the White House website. And so you look at the White House website, and I'm gonna show you the current one too. You look at the White House website, it looks pretty professional, right? Okay, that's the way it's supposed to look. Now, what happens if we took the exact same website and we changed it to red? It's the same website, but it feels different, right? It feels different. There's a different aura about it. It doesn't have the same stability feeling anymore. Let's go to today's website. Same thing, budget and spending, it's blue. We're professional, that sort of thing. Then suddenly you flip it to red, and it feels very different. And I think that's one of the big takeaways today with color theory is that what color you choose can have an, um, even if it's not an apparent feeling, even if it's not something that you intended to have happen, it subliminally can happen. So if you went to the, the White House website every day and this was what you were presented with, you'd start to have a certain feeling about what, what's going on. And that's very different than if you went to the White House website every day and you saw this. It feels different. And so you want to be aware of that as a designer. Purple. Purple is the color of royalty and sophistication. This goes way back when to when uh, royalty used to wear purple robes 
And the reason they wore purple robes is because nobody else could afford the dye to make purple because it was the most expensive dye. So if you were wealthy, if you were royal, you wanted to show that wealth by having purple because it was the most expensive clothing you could get because of that dye. So it shows wealth, it shows luxury. It's also somewhat spiritual in a sense, uh, associated with healing and the feminine qualities. It can be a bit gloomy or sad as well. Couldn't do the colors without talking about black and white. So black is usually symbolic of power. Uh, it's associated with elegance, sophistication, depth. I think one of the, the fun things to point out at this point is have you noticed that when architects come in to review, almost all of them wear black? Have you noticed this before? Right? You go into your final review, go to thesis at Berkeley. Everybody who presents wears black, and everybody who comes to review wears black. It's pretty funny. That's a conscious decision. It's different. If you wear blue, you stand out. You're different. If you wear red, heaven forbid you wear red, during that review, you stand out. It's different. So you want to think about that. So it's also associated with death or mystery or unknown. There's a reason black is the mourning color, as in I'm mourning for somebody's death, not it's early in the morning. Uh, it's the color of grief, mourning, or sorrow. White, on the other hand, symbolic of purity, innocence, shows cleanliness, safety. White can also be cold or distant. You can think about snow. White can be cold. Uh, so there's a little bit of that association with it as well. So how about this? Research reveals that all human beings make an unconscious, notice unconscious here, judgment about a person, environment, or item within 90 seconds of the initial viewing so that's a short window of time, 90 seconds, that's it, minute and a half. And that between 62 and 90% of that assessment is based on color. Do you think color is important? It absolutely is. This is what I'm talking about on, when I showed you those uh, White House websites. Having it dominated by red gives us a different impression than having it dominated by blue. So you want to be aware of this. So how about this, the color emotion guide. I think this is interesting when you start to take all of those brands. We did a whole lecture on logos. Now here's a bunch of logos. And these companies have chosen certain logos for a reason, certain colors in their logos for a particular reason. And it's kind of funny where certain places end up. You know, Whole Foods, John Deere, no surprise that they're in the green realm. As we work our way out, I think there's some oddballs in the purple but we'll get to Yahoo in a bit. Uh, the, the youthful excitement, the red, okay, a lot of those make sense as being red items. And we push our way all the way out and we have the ones that try to be all inclusive like Google, right? Windows, NBC, eBay, etc. So it's just kind of interesting going, notice also, this is fun, Apple is at one end and Windows is at the other. Just kind of a fun thing to think about. So let's look at some case studies. Okay, you guys ready to go back in time? Some of you might not have been born. Yahoo, 1996, baby. That's what Yahoo homepage looked like. A little different than it looks today. So let's look at this. Remember in 1996, well, I don't know, maybe I can't say remember in 1996. Um, for me, remember, <laughs> for you, way back before you were born in 1996, um, the, the internet was a new thing, I know, shocking, right? You had to wait to connect to it, it was really slow, all of those kinds of things. This was Yahoo's homepage. So if we think about the fact that the internet was new and we look at this, no surprise that it's exciting, Yahoo picks red for their logo. Yahoo's a new and exciting thing. You go do your searching at Yahoo. Now the rest of it, the fact that all the text was blue, that's just old school, that's because text links were always blue. But the Yahoo logo is an important thing to think about. Let's jump forward four years. Here's the year 2000. I think most of you were born by this point. Okay? This was the first dot-com bubble. And the idea here was, oh man, you can buy stuff online. No way. I know, in the world of Amazon now, it's like, what do you mean? This was, this was a new concept. So guess what? Yahoo, logo's still red. We're still exciting. We're still relevant. Come, come to Yahoo. But look at all the green on the page. 
And look at the big box for Yahoo Shopping. Remember, green is about money. They're making a conscious decision to emphasize that right now in the year 2000. Let's jump forward, 2003. We see our first introduction to a little bit of purple on the Yahoo homepage. It's also starting to get a lot more cluttered. Yahoo logo still red. We move forward a little bit more, 2005. Purple's still there, Yahoo logo still red. There is also association, things like um, red and or pink. We have the shopping box. It's obviously close to Valentine's Day when I pulled this slide. So there's an association there with Valentine's Day, pink, red, etc. You get that passion. Jump forward, 2007. Yahoo, we want to be like Google. Oh wait, no we don't. So big jump, 2007, 2009. Yahoo logo changes from being red. We're an exciting new internet company to we want to be the luxury provider. We want to be the, the, the stable, the, the, the high-end email client. I know that's like Yahoo high-end doesn't, doesn't compute, but we switch all the page over to purple. And notice how much purple is now on that page. So they've changed their color scheme a little bit. Notice also the web search button is yellow, so it's still drawing your attention to that. Yellow and purple are complementary colors, so we see that. Purple gets a little bit darker, and I had to include this one because of the rare sea creature found off the California coast. Sorry, it, it's just amusing. This was in 2013. A lot more purple on the page. We're starting to see a trend here. 2016, 2017, see it's starting to look fairly consistent. Remember Yahoo got sold to Verizon? So guess what? Things change. Here it is as of this morning. Yahoo logo changed. It became a lighter purple. Search bar became blue. So they're flipping more into the blue. I wouldn't be surprised if Verizon ended up rebranding them back to red going forward. So it's just interesting to see this progression over time. From 1996 all the way to 2019, subtle changes, but they're color relevant. The designers are picking the colors for a reason. How about this, 1997, we're going back in time again. Apple computer, a lot of red. We're an exciting company. This whole internet thing is new. We'll see a lot, of, a lot of red there. Remember, Apple was about to die right here. Steve Jobs come in, total rebranding in 1998. Colors are completely different. They wanted to give the impression that Apple went from about to die to being, no, we're actually a real company, we're stable again. Remember, stable was always about those neutral colors, the blues, the blacks, and that sort of thing. All we see on here are blues, blacks, tans. We're stable again. So it's subtle decisions going forward. The rainbow logo is still here in 1998, by the way. Okay, then we go forward to 2000. Steve Jobs is revamping the personal computer. We, anybody remember these computers? Okay, a few of you. This was a big deal. Before, computers were really ugly. And now, all of a sudden, computers were cool. They were a luxury item. So they made these computers in a couple different colors. It was like tangerine and some kind of blue and purple and, I think, white. But notice the one that appears on the home page is the purple one because it's a luxury item. This is a, a different product than everybody else has. You, consumer, want this product because this is the high-end cool product to have. So they're picking the purple one on purpose. Then we move forward a little bit. Again, we're trying to exude that stability. Notice the apple turns blue. We're definitely a stable company. It's 2001. I think the stuff on here is great. Mac OS X comes out. Adobe Illustrator 10 comes out. That's like ancient history. Star Wars Episode II comes out. 2001. <coughs> The all-new airport. Then we move forward. 2002, that blue Apple logo turned gray. And now we're getting an awful lot of blue on the screen. We're a nice, stable company. 
Holiday gift guide is in green. Spend your money here. Translation. Anybody remember these ads? Okay, so remember 2004, the iPod was kind of this luxury item. Nobody had, you know, and it was it was basically the iPod was the first MP3 player that any, you know, I guess there was the Sony mini disc player or whatever. I mean, there was a few other ones that never went anywhere. But the iPod became this luxury item. And so when they did these commercials, they picked the background. I mean, they were brilliant commercials, but they picked the background of purple for a reason. It's the luxury item. It's the item that you want. So we're seeing that introduction of purple again as part of this product. Then we move forward, 2006. We want to be in like the professional workspace. We want people to use our, our, our workstations for doing video editing. We're branding ourselves as this big, stable, black and white company, etc. 2007, the new iMac. A lot of color on this particular page. Notice the top ribbon up there changed from being flat to having a little bit of shine to it, a little bit of depth, a little bit of shadow. Move forward, 2010, that, that top gets a little bit darker. I love this, 2010. Look at the iPhone in 2010. It looks so old, doesn't it? 2011, that bar up the top gets a little bit darker. So we're seeing that progression getting a little bit darker. iPhone 5 comes out, that bar up at the top gets a little bit darker. So this, September 18th, 2013, still seems like ancient history. This was actually a big shift in Apple. Uh, this is when Johnny Ives changed the, he's the, the head designer for Apple. He changed all the UI um, in, in OS X and in the iPhone to be flat so that we no longer had shine and three-dimensionality to all the icons. This was a really big shift in, in UI design. Nobody had done it before. As soon as Apple did it and pushed it out to all their devices, everybody changed. All the rest of the companies followed. So I think this is a big change. And he is fundamentally responsible for this change. And we still see that change today. Interestingly enough, the shine still exists on that top bar in 2014, which I'm surprised about. Uh, when we jump forward, there we go. Shine's gone. And it's going to stay gone. That bar is just going to continue getting darker as we go forward. A little bit darker still. You see, each, each year it gets progressively darker. And there it is as of this morning, almost completely black. So we're seeing that progression all the way through. And it's interesting to look at that in context. So there's a lot more websites, palette and colored. We're going to go to both palette and colored today, uh, color lovers. Um, and so all of these images that I got of websites are uh, from an internet wayback machine or the internet archive where they're actually charting pages over time. So you can go back. If you have a particular company or business or website that you want to go back and look at, you can actually go back and see what it used to look like. You can even look at the digital tool site, what it looked like when I first started teaching in 2007. So things evolve, and this is a way of going back and kind of seeing those, those old school things. OK, so we're going to move into a bunch of examples and sample images for assignment 104. These are your Charlie Harpers. Today, as part of your exercise, and I am going to do a little bit of demo today, uh, but as part of your exercise in part one, I'm going to ask that you search and look for a Charlie Harper image to use as a model for your Charlie Harper. You shouldn't copy it directly, but you can adapt it. You can change it. You make it your own. But I think if you start from one of his original works, you're going to have a far better shot at, at creating a nice Charlie Harper versus one that is not so good. So I'm going to encourage you to pick one that starts from him. Uh, Charlie Harper was an illustrator in the 1950s. He was known for his paintings. All of this was done without Illustrator, the program. This was done by hand. Um, and essentially what he did is he abstracted animals, birds, into basic shapes. So he's flattened them out. There's no three-dimensionality to it. So there's no shadows. There's, no, um, there's nothing with depth. It's all just layers. And he's used those basic shapes and those layers to create some really nice, strong compositions. There's usually a repeating pattern of some point. You see the circle pattern in this example repeating over and over. But two of the circles change from being leaves to being the two birds. 
Notice also that there's a really strong diagonal in this composition. So the compositional techniques that we talked about in the Photoshop section still apply. Another example here, with all the vultures picking on the snake carcass, same shapes used in repetition. The only thing that's different is what they're holding, and the last one is mirrored, which also makes a big difference in the composition. Typically, when it comes to motion, he uses outlines for motions. So in this case, the hummingbird wings, we see a repetition of the wing pattern, but it's not filled in. And we get those overlapping uh, little semicircles. Another example here with the circle repeating, and one of the circles becomes the bird. Again, really strong diagonal in this composition. He does a lot with, with birds and bugs, the two ladybugs interacting. more examples. And you guys will spend time looking online. Notice that every time it's flattened. So this one's looking uh, down from above, but we've still flattened the fox out into its basic shape. The ticks are in front of the fox. So we're establishing those layers each time. This one has a little bit too much three-dimensionality, too much perspective to it. So it's not my favorite example. I think this one is, however, one of the best ones, where we've got lots of different layers of these shapes. We have the leaf that's floating on the circle, or it's floating on the circle. It's floating on the water, which is represented by those concentric rings, the white rings. Then we have the lily pads that are below that. Then we have below that, we have the snake. Then we keep going down, we have the fish. So you keep working your way down in all of these little slices. And he's flattened each slice out going forward. That's a blurry picture. So those are all his work. So what I'm asking you to do is find one of his pieces that looks interesting to you and then adapt it for your own. And so I'm going to show you a bunch of student work that's based on the stuff that you just saw going forward. So each of these feels very much like a Charlie Harper. You're obviously doing it in Illustrator. He did them by hand. But it's still distilled into basic shapes. So each one of these is fundamentally basic shapes and repetition of patterns. You saw this one with the repeating pattern. Actually, you might not have seen this one, the scratching the backs. The student changed it and is holding the knife. So there's little subtle changes that students do, and that's part of what makes it their own. This one could very easily have been one of Charlie Harper's. It looks, it looks that similar. And that's what I'm asking you guys to do. You guys saw the raccoons? She adapted it with the raccoons with the barbecue in front. So subtle things, subtle changes. Right? The flamingo gets a few extra S turns here. It doesn't have to be realistic, but notice that this is built out of basic shapes. It's built out of those circles. It's built out of the triangle. And that's part of what makes this read really nicely. I had to include this one. It's a little bit too three-dimensional. But the, the interactions of the various bars, I think, is just really nicely done, so I had to include it, uh, because the elephant reaches up through the, the patterns of repetition. So I had to include that one. OK, so you can, of course, look on the course website for other student examples. In terms of the assignment, or the exercise for today, under part one, I'm asking you to find a Charlie Harper example and then post it. Then we'll get into swatches, and I'm going to show you the swatch stuff in just a second, and you'll post that. Most of your time today will be spent working on your Charlie Harper and getting started on it. You do not have to write any comments for today's exercise. So there's no comments required. You get a day off of comments. Okay. So give me a second to switch over, and I'll go through the swatches, uh, and then I'll turn you guys loose, and you can use your time to get yourself ahead for the assignment. All right, so we're going to continue on here uh, with swatches. Uh, the purpose today is to figure out how to create um, a library of colors that you'll want to use. Um, and so we're going to use a couple websites to go through creating that. Um, the swatches are important because it's a way of repeating 
a particular color and always using the same color as we go forward. I wish that I could teach you guys color calibration when it comes to what you see on the monitor matching what comes out of the printer. Uh, but alas, we don't have the correct equipment here to do that. I've requested it, but they still don't seem to want to calibrate everything. Uh, so I can't teach you color profiles as much as I would like to. So what we're going to do, though, is we're going to go to uh, a couple different websites. The first one is palatin.com. Right here. And this is a color scheme designer uh, website. And so the point here is depending on which style we pick, we can pick a group of colors. So as I swing this arc around, let's say in the blue here, I'll get a primary blue color, and then I'll get a series of analogous colors that are lighter and darker to this one blue color. So they're lighter and darker of the, the, of the single blue color here. Uh, and as I continue to swing this around, I'll get those same color groups. The arc here in the center allows us to separate the colors so I can get from dark to light or not quite as close like that, they become a little bit closer. So depending on how far apart it is, the analogous nature of the colors becomes closer or further. If I come up here, we've been working in monochromatic for right now. The next group here is, they call it adjacent colors. I would call this analogous colors. But we're getting a different spectrum of colors. The three groups, oops, sorry, grab it by the middle. This gives us a primary color in the middle. So in that case, there's our primary color. And then we get groups of colors that are analogous to it. That's the primary. These are the two analogous colors. They look very similar to each other. Remember, analogous colors are close together on the color wheel. When we come to the next one here, this is the triad, or the three colors. I would call this a split complement color. So if we took our primary color right here, and we went directly across, our standard primary would be yellow. We split it, and we get something that's a little bit more gold and something that's a little bit more green. And so the split complement can be nice, because we have a primary and basically two complements to it. And so I can swing that around, and you can see that we can create um, a swatch based on a primary color and then the split complements of that primary color. If we come down to the next one here, this is called the tetrad and it's essentially two analogous colors and they're two complements. So our, our, um, if this was our primary, sorry, let me see, there's our primary right here. And if I were to pick red as the primary, for example, the complement to red would be green. So over here on my color space, the complement to this red would be this green. Then I have an analogous color, which is this orange. There's my analogous. And the complement to that analogous would be this kind of teal color. So I'm getting two colors that are analogous and their complements. And then we can come to this last one where you can essentially freestyle. You can create your own colors if you want. I'm going to encourage you today to stick in the first four, depending. Uh, I'm going to do the split complement here as a choice, and I will pick whatever, um, let's pick that blue as my primary, and I'm going to get these two as my secondary colors. I'm going to swing this a little bit more. Let's go right there. So my primary color is this teal. I've got red, and I've got this kind of goldish color. Once I have my color palette kind of established here, I'm going to come down to the Tables and Export tab. And when I do that, we're going to get our primary and our split secondary colors, our split complement colors, and then the, the range of lighter to darker, and you can kind of see them against each other. Now, each one of these has a couple codes below it. So if we look here, there's an RGB value. So in this case, this particular color, this primary color, has an RGB value of 34 red, 103 green, and 101 in the um, blue. So if I wanted to go into Illustrator, give me a second to open this. It doesn't matter the size, because I'm just using this as an example right now. Uh, if I wanted to create that particular color as a fill color, for example, I can come down here and I can see RGB, and I could copy 
this 34, 103, 101. And so if I went here and I typed 34, 103, and 101, I would get that particular color. So you can see I can recreate that color here. The color also has a hexadecimal value, which is listed on the website as well. So right there, 226765, 226765. So it's just another reference to this particular color. Now, it would be a lot of work to recreate this color palette based on uh, going in, writing down those numbers, there's the color, uh, and basically creating it manually. Sorry, wrong page here. By typing in these numbers. So instead of doing that, I'm going to come over to their uh, export. And right here, I'm going to go to color swatches. There it is. And I have choices. PNG image, ACO Photoshop, GPL, which would be a GIMP file, or a, as a sketch palette. The only one that is an Adobe product is the Photoshop. And unfortunately, this website only gives us Photoshop. It would be great if they just gave us an Illustrator swatch, but they don't. So uh, actually, even better, it would be a swatch exchange file. So we're going to take the Photoshop file uh, for now. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the ACO Photoshop. And it's going to download a file that's called mypalette.aco. And so this is a uh, Photoshop color palette. So in order to access it, I'm going to have to minimize um, Illustrator for now. I'm going to go ahead and have to open up Photoshop. And this, by the way, is written out in the uh, Photoshop 1.23. So everything that I'm doing is here. And I don't need a document in Photoshop. I just need to be able to see the, the, um, the color palette. So I'm going to go up to my uh, file menu. Excuse me, is it file or edit? No, it's the edit menu. Apologize for that. Presets and then preset manager. So it's edit, presets, preset manager. That brings up this preset manager. I'm not working on brushes, so I'm going to change from brushes to the next one down, which is swatches. So I'm working on swatches. So these are all the swatches that are predefined in Photoshop that should load up automatically. I want to take a note of where the last swatch is, because mine, when I load them in, are going to be after this. So I've got this brown color as kind of the last one. So when I load in my new ones, they're going to show up right here. I'll click on the Load button. And then I'll go into my Downloads folder, which is where this was saved. I'll find my mypalette.aco file. There it is. And I'll go ahead and click on Load. And so starting right after that brown, I get my set of color swatches, which are these teal, then these kind of goldish brown, and then these red. So if I were to hold down Shift, I could select, you see that this first one is selected, I could select all of my color palette. So right there, there's 15 total colors in it. So I've clicked on the first one, I've held down Shift on the keyboard, and clicked on the last one. Now it would be super logical of Adobe to let you just save the set as a uh, Illustrator file. Unfortunately, that just continues to save a Photoshop file. So instead, we have to go to this little gear icon. And all Adobe's infinite wisdom, they put it completely hidden here, in here. And we're going to choose Save Swatches for Exchange. This is the universal swatch file for all Adobe products. So you can now go from Photoshop, you can go to um, InDesign, you can go to Illustrator, it doesn't make any difference. So it would be nice if it just saved as this to begin with. But we're going to go ahead and say Save Swatches for Exchange. And I'll put this into today's folder, so bear with me while I get there. Uh, what are we on? 115. There we go. And so this is And I'll go ahead and click on Save. OK, so I've saved those. That's enough for Photoshop for right now. I'm going to jump back over into Illustrator. And I'll show you how to load them. But before we load them, the easiest way of, of showing you that you know how to load them is I have a document that's pre-prepared for you to make this to make your life a little bit easier. I'll go to today's exercise on the course website. There's 115. There we go. And right here under Part 4, I have color swatch sample files ready for you. The one that I just created was a 15 color sample file. So I'll pick the one that says 15 colors. And we'll go ahead and just click on it. 
and it will download. And then I can go ahead and open it up in Adobe Illustrator. And so all, the, the, all that it is is it's a series of squares going across. And I can then apply all of my swatches and prove that I was able to load them. So I'm trying to save you the work. You don't have to create this yourself. Just download it, and you can. So when it comes time for swatches, we need to be able to load these into Illustrator. So I'll go ahead and go to my window, and then I'll choose Swatches from my window. There it is. The swatches aren't currently loaded. These are all the default swatches. I need to load a swatch, and I'll do that by clicking the little Fly Out menu right there. And I'm going to come down here to Open Swatch Library. There's a bunch of ones that are preloaded, but I want Other Library because I'm going to pick my own. So Open Swatch Library, Other Library. And I will go in here, and I will go to my uh, folder for today. And there's my swatch file, my Adobe Swatch Exchange file. And I'll click on Open, and it'll load up for me right there. So there's my swatches. All I have to do, I'll use my direct select tool, the white arrow, select the first object here, click on the first color. Select the second object, click on the second color. And I can now apply these swatches. The advantage of a swatch or a swatch file is that you'll always have the exact same color. You don't want to go through your designs and not be able to quickly pick the same color, not know what that color is. Uh, so for example, the Digital Tools website, I know precisely what the orange color is that I use. So if I create something new, I can always use the same orange. Uh, and that's the point. So I've gone through, I've picked those. We'll get to this last set. And there we go. So I was essentially able to prove that, yes, I was able to save the swatches, and yes, they were able to go here. You will make a post of this today as one of your posts. You will do that by going to File, and then uh, Export. And we're going to, uh, we can do Save for Web Legacy. That's fine. And there it is. Uh, let's change this to JPEG or PNG. It's really tiny, so let's make that a little bit bigger. Let's go to maybe uh, 1,000. There we go. And then you can go ahead and click on Save. Uh, alternatively, I think you can just go to, um, I think you might be able to go to Save As and change this. Nope. You have to go to Export. I apologize for that. Uh, so once again, it's File, Export. And then Save for Web Legacy is easy. You could also use Export As, uh, and then choose JPEG here and do it that way. So you're going to post this. So that was the first um, swatch. You need to do this swatch for sure. The other one that I'm going to show you is optional. This is the one in part three. It's a different website. It uh, doesn't quite involve as many steps, but it's kind of a cool one too. It's colored.com, C-O-L-R-D.com. They love to chop out. Uh, vowels there, so it's C-O-L-R-D. And the, uh, the cool thing about this is they generate color palettes based on images. And so we could go into the Create section here, and we can actually upload our own image. And we'll see if this works. Sometimes on the school computer it doesn't like to work. Uh, I checked it this morning on my computer, it worked fine, so we'll see. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click on the Open and then I'll click on Upload, so I can upload my own image. And I can then go into my flash drive, and I can choose one of my own images. All right, so I can pick this image, for example. And then it's going to pick a color palette based on that image. Um, so it's a little bit different way of creating a color palette. Uh, one of the strategies here might be to look up your Charlie Harper. So, Illustrator. Okay, let's say that this was the image that I liked. I could then save this image. So let me uh, save image as. Let me put it on the desktop. And then I could go back to the colored, and I could actually find out what the colors are in the image. Sorry, wrong one. Go back to create image. Let me go to desktop. 
There it is. We'll go ahead and open that. There it is. And it should pick out the primary colors of that image for me. So I can then take those colors. This is five colors. I could choose seven colors if I wanted. Gives me a little bit more. Then I'll go ahead and click on the Save button. And in this one, we have the ability to save directly into Illustrator, which is always nice. So you can click on the Illustrator button. And it should create, there it is, my color.ai. We can go into Illustrator. That was a seven color palette. So let me go to our sample files here. I'm going to choose the seven colors. We'll open that. There's the seven colors. I want to load the swatches the same way. Click the little fly out on the swatches window. Choose Open Swatch Library, Other Library. And we'll come down here to my, where was that? That was in Downloads. It was My Color. I'll go ahead and click on Open. And there it is. Those are the colors from that Charlie Harper image. Once again, I'll select the first one, Apply. Select the second one, third one. like that. So it's just another way of going through it. That one creates the Illustrator file for us so we don't have to go into uh, Photoshop. If I wanted this color palette to go into Photoshop, I would have to create the Adobe Swatch Exchange file. I can do that by clicking uh, on the swatches. I thought I could. Oh, I have to actually add it to my swatches and then I can export it. It doesn't really matter because chances are you're not going to need it to go that way or that direction. Okay, so your purpose today is to be able to, or your job today is to be able to get an example color swatch file. I think I say you need to upload the swatch file and the, the image. You're okay just uploading the image. I don't need the swatch file. Um, I believe you that you were able to create it. So um, I want you to do that. The balance of your time is to begin on your Charlie Harper composition. I'm going to show you one thing that I usually wait until next class, but I want to make sure you have it before the weekend because I think a lot of you will end up working on your Charlie Harper this weekend. Um, and that is called the Live Paint tool in Illustrator. So I will go over this again next class, but I would rather at least introduce it to you right now because it's pretty common um, that, uh, that students use this as part of the Charlie Harper. And so the idea here is that let's say I spend some time and I draw my pen tool here. And I draw my Charlie Harper. Oops, sorry about that. Oh, let's say it's like that. I know this looks corny, but I'm just trying to create some quick example, right? Um, and let me make sure that it has no fill. So I have these overlapping lines, and then maybe I have uh, And just use the pen tool real quick here. Oops. This has to be the world's ugliest bird ever. OK. It only has one wing, too. Um, so let's say that I, I, I drew this out, and I want to be able to fill in colors. Now, obviously, I could fill in, like I could say, oh, this is a shape, so I could fill that in with a particular color. But sometimes you might want to fill in uh, you know, like the shape that's in between those two wings, for example. We can do that with something called the Live Paint Tool. And the way the Live Paint Tool works, um, is that I would recommend before you do any live paint, you create a duplicate of your layer. So you'll do the live paint on a practice layer, 
in case something goes wrong. So don't do it on your primary layer. So I'm going to open up my layers palette first. Everything is currently on layer one. I want to create a duplicate of this layer. So I'll go ahead and click on the flyout menu, and I'll say duplicate layer one. That gives me a layer one copy. I'm going to work on the layer one copy, so I'll go ahead and turn off layer one altogether. So I just have the layer one copy showing. Then I will select all of my objects, so everything at once, everything selected. And then I will go up to Object, and then Live Paint Make. So it's Object, Live Paint, Make. And the selection changes to have these little stars in the corner. And from there, I can come and use the Live Paint tool, which I believe is hidden underneath this Shape Builder tool. You can also press K on the keyboard to get there. And the Live Paint bucket will essentially let me pick a particular color. And then as I go over my object, see how it highlights the shapes that are inside of my curves? I can choose to fill any one of those shapes. So I could fill this, this, and that if I wanted to. Or I could fill this. Or I could change my color and fill this and this. Or if I liked the bottom to be blue and I wanted the top to be a different color, I could change that color. Apparently, I'm really into blues and teals. Let's change that to be like a red or something. You get the idea. So I'm not stuck with just filling the circle. Does that make sense? So this is a way of kind of, once you have your line drawing, be able to selectively fill in certain parts of that particular drawing. Uh, and so I wanted to show you that because most people create the Charlie Harper as a bunch of outlines or a bunch of individual lines. Couple notes about the Live Paint tool. If I have, hold on a second. If I have an object like that, where I have something open, if I go to create a live paint, let me add one more line across it. So I'll select both of those objects. I'll go to Object, Live Paint, Make. And then I go to the Live Paint tool right here. I can fill this in, but I won't be able to fill that in because it's not closed at the end. So it does need to be a closed shape. It doesn't matter if they overlap. So I could close that off with a line, say like that. If I want to add that line to the Live Paint, I'm going to select it. I'll go up to Object, and then Live Paint, Merge. That adds the extra object in. And then I can go back to my Live Paint, and I'll be able to fill that one in too. Oops, I don't have a color, so you're not seeing it. I'd be able to fill that in and that in. So just be aware that it has to be actually closed. You can't have an open end to be able to live paint it. It's kind of like when you do hatching in AutoCAD. It won't let you do it if it's open. Um, so same concept. So I wanted to show you this a little bit early. I know I went through it rather quick. We'll spend much more time next class going through it. But a lot of you will start needing this going into the weekend. So I want to make sure that you have that uh, tool in your arsenal before you get, get going on it. OK. so. The swatches shouldn't take you too long. Remember, we start by finding a Charlie, Char Charlie Harper sample image. You'll make one post for that. Then you'll make a second post today for your, um, your color swatches. And then you're free to work on your Charlie Harper. You do not need to make any comments on anybody's work today. So you're free from doing that. And I would encourage you to use, use this time. I'm giving it to you for a reason. Gives you a couple hours to get ahead uh, going into your assignment, going into spring break, etc. Remember, the assignment is due next Wednesday. It's one week from today. You essentially have the skills now. You've had the practice with the pen tool. You can create this. Uh, big, big thing about it is to make sure that you flatten out the objects into shapes. So don't take a photograph of an animal and trace it, because it won't be abstract shapes. Look at the animal and make sure it becomes circles and squares and rectangles and those kinds of objects. That's the big thing about making it look like a Charlie Harper. OK? Are there any questions before I turn you loose? No? OK. I'll let you guys go.